ahead and go to 2 Corinthians this morning. 2 Corinthians, we're going to start reading in chapter 3. I've got, I'm going to, we're going to kind of go through chapter 3 and 4. Um, chapter 4 has the main thought that I'm wanting to cover this morning, but you have to get chapter 3 to get chapter 4. And unfortunately, many times we make the mistake, and I kind of showed this last week in the message I preached, of just kind of just zero in on a verse and not getting the context. And it's so important that we be diligent in our study and make sure we uh, get full context, make sure we're getting these things right, making sure we understand these things right. And so we're going to start reading in verse 1 of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It says, Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we as some others epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. I like what he says right there because we see in that this passage that we are epistles, all right? You know, an epistle, it's a letter. This is the epistle of Paul that he wrote. He wrote a letter, you know, proclaiming something and our lives say something. Whether you like it or not, you are sending a message with your life. Some of us are sending mess- messages of truth. Some of us are sending a message as a lie. Some of us are sending messages that we love the Lord. Some of us are sending messages we don't really love the Lord. You know, whether you like it or not, you're telling a story with the life you live without even opening your mouth. And that's something we ought to take serious and we need to make sure we're, you know, sending the right message. And so, you know, so it is. Whether you like it or not, you are telling a story. You're preaching a message every day. And you know, it'd be interesting if we were to go and Talk to some of your coworkers and talk to your neighbors. Hey, what's he preaching about? And you know, in your workplace, obviously, you know, you haven't got up and you haven't preached a message verbally like I'm doing right now. But you've preached a message in your workplace. I like, you know, it'd be interesting if we could find out what y'all been preaching. I don't know if any, you know, some of us get kind of nervous if we did that. And don't worry, I'm not going to do that to anybody. But it says in verse three, four, as much as you're manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink. But with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. Our message that we're speaking with our life, it's not written on paper anywhere, but it's written on the hearts of other, of other people. What, they, what many people think about Christianity today, it's based off of a message that somebody preached with their life that they lived. Not with a message that they heard in a church, but with the impression that they got from you. And people... They have a hard time getting past that. And many times we, we often give one message verbally, but we give another message with our actions. And you know what? People, they don't go off of what you say. They go off what you do. That's what they're looking at. And you know what? It's not what you have told them that they see as fact, but it's what they feel in their hearts. And we are, we are writing a message on people's hearts with our life. That's something that ought to scare us a little bit and ought to cause us to watch our step and watch what we do. So in verse 4, And such trust have we through Christ to Godward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. What does that mean when it says the letter killeth? Well, if we go by the letter of the law, we're all dead meat, folks. If we go by the letter of the law, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Okay, But thank God, there is a New Testament, and the New Testament, it is the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. He told that to His disciples at that Last Supper. And we can go to heaven today. We are on our way to heaven today because we have been resurrected spiritually and we walk in the Spirit. We, are, we do the good things that we do, not because we have to, but because we want to, because we love the Lord. And if it is, if we should not be as Christians, a te- you know, our testimony should not be that we're just like this walking rule book. Okay? You know, that, that shouldn't be what we are. You know, but a testimony of someone who does what they do, not out of fear, not out of necessity, but because they love the Lord. And listen, I've worked with other Christians before, and they've noticed, so they'll, they'll talk. I, I remember I, when I was a teenager, I worked at McDonald's, and I worked with a kid who went to a Christian school. And he had dyed his hair some crazy color, and he came to work. And, you know, of course, everybody's complimenting and telling him how great it is. Well, the next day, he comes back to work, and his hair is back to normal. And everybody's like, What happened? 
Uh, my Christian school made me dye my hair back to its normal color. You know, we're not, we're not allowed to do this. And then I remember one of them was like, you know, that's what I just don't like about Christians. All them and all their stupid rules and blah, blah, blah. And you know, does anybody think any church, uh, maybe some churches have, but any Baptist church is ever taught that, you know, you have to have a hair a certain color to go to heaven? I mean, have we, anybody ever taught that if you dye your hair, you're going to hell? Okay, I mean, nobody's ever preached it. I've never heard that preached in my life. But listen, you know, when you do, when you go and you make it all about these rules and you're complaining about the rules that they have in the church, the Christian school and things like that, you're just sending a message that all we are is a walking rule book. That all we are, you know, we just, we're doing all these things because we have to. You know, we got it. We go to church because, you know, we, those Christians, they go to church because they think if they don't go to church, they're going to go to hell. You know, they put their money in the offering plate because they think they're going to go to hell if they don't put their money in the offering plate or God's going to rain judgment on them. You know, you got to follow all these rules and do this and that. Folks, that's not why we do what we do. We do it because we love the Lord. We do it because we're saved. We do it because we want to please Him. We do it because following the Word of God, following His commandments, the Bible says they're not grievous. These things actually make us happy and that's why we do them. We're doing it not by the letter because the letter kill it. If we're just going off the letter of the law, if we're going off just a bunch of rules, we all fail and we're, we, we can't please God. But if we're doing it out of love, we're doing it in the Spirit, then that, uh, that's what pleases God. And you know what? Nobody can stop you from doing what you love to do. No one can, no, but nobody can, and nobody can stop you. Nobody has you to force you to do that. Listen, when a person loves the Lord, they're going to love the house of God. The Bible teaches that in 1 John. You're going to love the people of God. You're going to love the Word of God. You're going to want to be around the house of God. The pastor is not going to have to drag you into church. The pastor is not going to have to guilt trip you into coming to church when you love the Lord. We don't have to do any of those things. You're going to do it because you want to. And I'm not going to be able to stop you. And nobody's going to be able to stop you. And I'm not going to have to make a bunch of rules if people just love the Lord and they're walking in the Spirit. But what is the message that many people are sending today that Christianity is all about a bunch of rules? No, listen, it's not about just following the rules. The things that God has commanded us to do, they make us happy. They They give us blessings. They are good. They are right. I want to do them. And I'm afraid many people are sending the wrong message. And you wonder why people are running from church. You wonder why they can't get them to come to church. Listen, if we, would have, if we would have the right testimony, if we would walk in the Spirit, if we would love the Lord, if we were doing things for the right reasons, we wouldn't be able to stop people from coming to this church. Because they're going to want what we have. Most, of the pe- most people there are miserable. And you know what? There's no exception in many churches today. They're miserable too. Everybody shows up to church. They drag their carcasses in on Sunday morning because they feel like they've got to do it. You know, they do. They go through the motions, and it is. It's all just a tradition. It's all something that they do to ease their conscience. And if that's why you're doing the things you do, everyone knows it. Every, everybody knows it. People aren't stupid. They can see through right through those things. And you are sending a bad message. You are writing a message on people's hearts that church is no fun. You're writing a message on people's hearts that, you know, you know you've got to do all these things or you're just going to go to hell. And, there, and these people there are like, you know what, I can't do all that. I can't be as good as those people. I can't follow all those rules, so I'm not even going to try. But we know that it's not about following a bunch of rules. It's about believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And we say we've done that, but then we act like serving God is a big pain in the neck. And it's this big responsibility. And we're a martyr. Because we have to go to church and we ain't built up money in the offering plate. And we do all these things. That is a horrible, horrible message that you're sending. You are writing something on people's hearts that it's going to be tough to erase. And we better watch ourselves on these things. The letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Are you doing what you do because of the letter? Because you have to or because you want to? Listen, we're supposed to be studying the Bible because we're, just, we're trying to figure God out. Hey, what does God want? What pleases God? And it just turns out that that law, that even the Old Testament law, with the exception of the carnal ordinances that Jesus Christ completed, we find out that these are the things that please God. And so you know what? I want to do those things. I want to live that kind of life. I want to have that kind of morality. I don't have to do that to go to heaven. I put my faith and trust in Christ. 
He's cleansed me of my sins. But I want to please Him. And so I'm going to do this because this is what I want to do. And you know what I've learned as a pastor? You can't stop people from doing what they want to do. You can't. You can't. And you can't make them do what they don't want to do for very long. And so I don't, tr- I don't try to force anything. I just try to get people to want to do the right thing. And I, just, I, I refuse to be a truant officer you know, for God's people. I, just, I, I refuse to do that. I, that's a big waste of time. If people want to be here, I won't be able to stop them from being here. If they don't want to be here, I can't make them. And I don't want to make them. I don't want to drag you in here because if I drag you in, you're going to drag in your sorry attitude. And your sorry attitude is going to spread around. And that's the last thing we need around here. So, uh, you, know, just, you, know, you need to be doing things because you want to please the Lord. And if, I, if, I am, if I'm dragging you in here, if I'm bringing you in here on gunpoint, guess who you're trying to please? You're trying to please me. We're supposed to be trying to please God. But verse 7 says, But the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was, glor- was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. What's that talking about here? Okay, That's talking about what was glorious versus what's more glorious? That's talking about the Old Testament versus the New Testament. And you see, the New Testament, it was, it's, it's so much better than the Old Testament. The Bible calls it a better testament. It was better. We are all condemned by the Old Testament because we all have violated the laws of the Old Testament. If you violated one, you're guilty of all of it. And the Old Testament, it condemns every one of us, and the Bible says it was glorious. In fact, it was so glorious, we're going to see, that when Moses, when God gave it to Moses, and Moses came down from the mountain, his face shone, and the people couldn't even handle looking at Moses. That's how glorious it was, and that was something that was temporary, something that was abolished, and God says this New Testament is far more glorious than that. It excelleth it. It's better than it. You know, so we're all condemned by the Old Testament, but we are we have eternal life through the New Testament, which is the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. So verse 12, seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Listen, the way of salvation is clear. A little child can understand real salvation. We've got these scholars that are out there that want to you know, complicate salvation. They want to make it this big intellectual thing. They, 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 they make it confusing. Well, listen, if somebody gives a salvation message that's confusing, just mark it down. It's not of God. Yeah. If it's not clear, it's either not of God or he's just a crummy preacher. That's all there is to it. Salvation, it is clear and we use great plainness of speech. How do I, what am I saying to do to get saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's pretty clear, isn't it? That's real, it's real clear. That's what salvation is. You don't have to become a member of a church and complete you know, several levels of qualifications before we give you the secret of eternal life. You know, and that's how it is in a lot of these places. You know, a lot of these cults, you know, they have all these secret societies and you know, you got to you got to achieve all these levels. You know, it's kind of like the Masonic Lodge and stuff. You know, you got to, as you get to the next level, you know, they give you the next part of the story, you know, until you hit that, you know, highest degree and then, you know, you get the hidden knowledge. Well, you know what? Hey, around here, I mean, we unload the truck to anybody. We preach the same thing to the little kids that we do to the older people. You know, we'll preach. We'll preach the same stuff to visitors as we do to the church members. We pre- the way of salvation is something that is supposed to be clear, and we use great plainness of speech. And so we do. But not only are we just real clear about it here, we even go from house to house and spread our doctrine around. We're going to go out today, and we're going to go out, and we're going to tell perfect strangers what we're all about. We're going to tell, we'll, we'll unload the truck. If they want to know, we will tell them what they want to know. We're not going to hold it back. We're not going to go out there. And if anybody asks any questions, well, listen, before we can give you that, you got to come be a member of the church. 
and you got to be there for so long, and you got to get baptized, and you got to take some classes, and you've got to, you know, do this ritual and wear a blindfold, and you know all these things, and then we're gonna, then we'll give you the answer to that question. No, we'll spill the beans right there. You know what we'll even do? We even give, we'll even give them Bibles that's got everything in it. And we, and we, we take our messages, you know, you got some churches, they like to password protect everything or they're, they don't want to put it out there because, you know, they don't want to get anybody mad at them. Man, we put it out there all over the place and we, we try to spread it around. I want everybody to hear what I'm saying. I want everybody to hear this message because this isn't my message, it's the Word of God and I want to spread it around. And so I'm, we're going to use great plainness of speech. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, I'm not going to water it down. You know, we're not going to make it politically correct. We're just going to lay it out there. And, and you know what? It makes some people mad. Okay? It, it makes some people mad, but I'd rather make them mad telling them the truth than make them really mad someday when they're going to hell and wonder why I didn't tell them the truth. Amen. And so, you know, we can defend them now or later. Let's get it over with the way I see it. Maybe they'll get saved. So is there, you know, the way of salvation is clear. There's nothing hidden. All right there, plain as day, out in the open. Verse 13, it says, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. Okay? That, that, that old, those Old Testament carnal ordinances, those things were abolished. And Moses, he had to wear a veil over his face because the people couldn't even handle looking at the face of Moses. The glory of God is shining off of him. And they couldn't, ha- they couldn't handle that which was only temporary. And so, you know, the Old Testament was so glorious that people couldn't handle looking at Moses after he received it. And it was temporary. And, this, and he's saying here, and you know what? The New Testament is even better. It's even greater than that. So we ought to be overwhelmed by it. We ought to be excited by it. Verse 14, But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, talking about their hearts, the veil shall be taken away. Okay, that veil, I believe that Moses wore, it didn't completely block out the light. Okay, but it did make it easier for the people, you know, the people were at least able to handle looking at him. Okay, when the light was kind of blocked a little bit, uh, when it wasn't real clear. And listen, these, it talks about how these people, when they were when they're reading the Old Testament, referring specifically to the Jews, they were the ones who read the Old Testament. The Bible says there's a veil on their heart. What does that mean? It means they, they, the truth. It's kind of you know, it's being muffled. It's being hid. It's not real clear. Something's covering it. Okay, and we see throughout the Bible and throughout the Gospels. Why did the Jews not you know believe on Jesus, or why did they not accept Jesus as the Messiah? Even though the Old Testament prophesied of a Messiah and Jesus fulfilled every one of those prophecies. You know why? Because of unbelief. They had unbelief in their hearts. They had a heart problem. Therefore, they could not see the truth. And he's saying here, it's still like that to this day, but if their hearts would turn to the Lord, okay, even though they're blind, it says in Romans, blindness in part is happened to Israel. They're not completely blind. It, you know, if they would at least, if their hearts would turn to the Lord, the Bible says, in other words, if they would believe on Him, that veil would be taken away and they would be able to see things clearly. When, I re- when you read some of those Old Testament prophecies and you think, you know, how does a Jew read the book of Isaiah and not realize that Jesus is the Christ? How is that? They have a veil over their heart. But if they would, if they would turn from their unbelief and they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that veil would be taken away and they would see Isaiah just like we see Isaiah. But they're, they're reading the Old Testament right now kind of with a, like a blindfold. Yeah. And so they're not, they're not seeing it clearly. And they need to believe and that veil will be taken away. But it says in verse 14, their minds were blinded for until this day remain at the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Uh, I already read that. And so, uh, verse 17, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit 
of the Lord. We have liberty in Christ. We are not separated from God because of our sins. The truth is right there for us. And there's no, you know, there is no sin that's going to stop you from clearly seeing the truth except the sin of unbelief. And that was the problem they had. They wouldn't believe Christ. And so you know what he would do? He'd speak to them in parables and he wouldn't give them understanding. He would speak the truth to them, but he would utter in dark sayings in ways that they wouldn't get it because he would, it was not for them to know because they had a heart of unbelief. There are some things that only saved people are going to be able to understand. That's an, one of the amazing things about this Bible that we have is it's all right there. The same thing that we've got right here, any lost person, go out and buy them a King James Bible anywhere. But you know what? Until they have a heart of belief, until they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, there are some things that is just going to, going to go right over their head and they'll never get it. They can't get it. The Bible says the natural man cannot receive the things of God. Why? Because those are spiritual things. These people are dead spiritually, so they can't understand that. They're literally they're incapable of it. So now chapter 4. Now we get to chapter 4, verse 1. He says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we receive mercy, we faint not. So what is this ministry that he's talking about? Well, I believe it's that ministration of the Spirit that he mentions in chapter 3, verse 8. Seeing we have this ministry, this ministration of the Spirit. It says in verse 2, But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Y'all see that? If our gospel be hid. Okay, the gospel, it is, it's very clear. We use great plainness of speech. Why is it that some people can't get it? Because they got to have a heart of unbelief. Okay, they, need to, they need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They need to trust Him. Why can't they see it? Verse 4, "...in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves servants for your sake." For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. For we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Okay, And this takes me to what the message and what I, the, main, the main thing I want to get across to you right now. As Christians, you know, we know we're supposed to shine. That is our job. Just like that Old Testament, it made the face of Moses shine. The Bible says we've got something better. We've got the New Testament. And it's in us. And we are supposed to shine. We are supposed to shine the light on this world. And listen, a lot of people, they've got a veil over their heart. It's sometimes it's hard for that light. They're going to turn away from that light. The Bible says men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. But we have a responsibility to make sure our light is shining. We have this ministration of the Spirit. It's a ministry. We are writing an epistle on people's hearts. And if we're going to send the right message, we have to be shining as lights and we need to be shining brightly. And so how do we do that? You know, what are some things that we do to shine brightly as Christians? Because what a lot of people are going to today, they're, they're actually, they're going to, they're backing off on the soul winning. They're backing off on proclaiming the gospel. They're backing off on hard preaching. They're watering everything down. And they're going into this lifestyle evangelism stuff. A lot of churches, you know, they're backing off on just, you know, the, you know, hardcore preaching. And it's always just this friendly community stuff that they're doing just to show, hey, we're one of you, you know, let's, let's make peace with everybody. And they're backing off of the gospel. And I'm going to show you, that's actually counterproductive. It's actually having the opposite effect when we do those things. But we see the first thing we have to do to be shining as Christians. So to let our light shine and actually accomplish something is we have to be proclaiming the word of God verbally. Okay, Look what he says in verse 3. But if our, if our gospel, 
be hid. It is him that it is hid to them that are lost. What is our gospel? It is the gospel of Christ. It's a message that we're spreading. It's good news that we're proclaiming. It says in verse five, for we preach not ourselves. Okay, that's what the lifestyle evangelism is all about. Hey, look at us. Look at us. Look how smiley I am. Look at how friendly I am. You know, look at how loving and how sweet we are. You know, look how inclusive we are. You know, we're all so great. You know. And you know, hoping we're going to bring people to Jesus that way. But we preach not ourselves. But we preach Christ. Okay? It's a verbal thing that we have to do. And people are trying to... They're leaving that part out. That is the main thing we do to shine is we verbally proclaim the gospel. Mark 16, 15. And he saith, said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go just preach it to everybody. Spread it around. Matthew 10, 27. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in the light, and what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. We're supposed to be getting on the housetops and proclaiming it. Why would we do that? We can reach more people. More people will hear us. More people will see us. That's why we use things like the internet today. You know, we've used the radio and things like that in the past. Well, so more people will hear the gospel. So more people will hear the message. And you know what? He, when he mentions how he mentions fear not, and which is able to kill the body, we're going to have opposition. When we go out knocking doors, we're competing with the Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, when we when we knock on doors, we're interrupting somebody's television program. Somebody's watching, you know, the liberal news media, you know, lying about Christians and stuff. And we've got competition. Okay? We've got opposition in some places. I mean, it's physical opposition. I mean, you're putting your life in your hands given the gospel. Thank God it's not like that in America right now. But we've got opposition. In Acts 20, verse 18, it says, They were coming to him, he said unto them, Ye know that from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mine, and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying of the weight of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repenting towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, he didn't hold back anything. He gave them whatever they needed to know. Anything they needed to know, he shared it with them and he did it from house to house. Why did he do that? He's making sure everybody's hearing it. I want everybody to hear this. I want everybody to know this. Why? Paul wanted to shine as a light and the main way we let our light shine is not by being all smiley and friendly and all that kind of thing. All right? And, and, you know, and that's fine being friendly and all that stuff, but we've got to be opening our mouth and saying something. Amen. We've got to be verbally going out there. And listen, you know, soul winning times isn't the only time you can go soul winning. You know, soul winning, it's, it's an everyday, everywhere, to everybody thing. And we need to be doing that. But listen, you know, I like soul winning times. You know, sometimes we do. I mean, how often do we actually strike up conversations about these type of things? You know, how, we're from Illinois. We don't talk to each other when we're in town. We walk through the stores and we just, you know, we don't even look at each other. We don't make eye contact because they might smile and say hi or something. You have to say hi back. You know, when we're in restaurants, we don't talk to each other. You know, you don't talk to other people. Now, down south, they do that. Down south, everybody starts talking to each other and having a conversation. But we're from Illinois. We don't do that. We're not friendly. You know, we're, you know, we're, you know, we get mad. That's rude to talk to somebody while they're eating. You know, our, our culture's, our culture's messed up. You know, we, I think we need to work on that and fix that. That's another message for another day. But listen, you're not going to get that many opportunities just striking up normal conversations. I mean, how many conversations did you have with strangers this week? You know, most of us probably didn't have too many. But you know what? So, because we live in this kind of culture where we're just not supposed to talk to each other, we got to actively go out of our way and take time and knock on people's doors, interrupt their television program, take a chance of making them mad at us, and verbally tell them. It's the best way to do it. It is the best way. I give, you know, that's when you're going to give the gospel out most of the time. So we need to be verbally proclaiming the Word of God. But then, yes, our life needs to back up what we're preaching. Okay, but listen, I'm going to show you this, this lifestyle evangelism stuff. It is it's, it's counterproductive in many ways. Matthew 514 says, "Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. 
Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now in verse 2 of 2 Corinthians 4, he says, But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifest manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Okay, a mistake that Christians often make is focusing on the light they focusing on the lifestyle and leaving out the verbal message. Okay, and here's the problem with that. When we make lifestyle evangelism the focus, it, it, it actually does more harm than good. Because remember verse 5, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and our self-service for your sake. If it's all about lifestyle evangelism, it's not about a verbal message, then who are we going to be pointing them to? It, it's, it's just yourself. We don't preach ourselves. We preach not ourselves, but Christ crucified. But he also says, you know, we're supposed to do the good works. We're supposed to renounce the things of dishonesty and all that. We're supposed to do that. But why is it? Okay, so is it because, you know, if we get enough sin out of our life, that'll help us shine brightly? Yes, that's going to help. But here's, here's the reason we need to get rid of those things. Because those sins are going to get people focused on us. If we're out there sinning and being dishonest, Guess who they're going to be paying more attention to? They're going to be paying more attention to us. And the goal is not to get them looking at us, it's to get them looking at Christ. And so we do need to make sure we keep sin out of our life. We want to keep our lives pure and clean. We want to be doing good works so we're not a distraction. We don't do those things to try to get everybody's attention. We're not going to go out and get all our church together and wear a bunch of pink shirts and go cleaning up streets and all that kind of stuff. And hey, everybody, look at us. We're so friendly and wonderful for the community. No, we don't want them looking that close at us. We'll be a distraction. What we want to do is we want to make sure we're doing good and we're not doing the bad so they will not get distracted by us when we're giving our verbal message out. Because if we do, if we're doing bad things, all right, if they see you instead of cleaning up the streets, they see you littering the streets, then they're going to get distracted by that and not listen to what you're saying. So understand, you know, lifestyle evangelism, it's counterproductive. It gets people to focus on our works, hoping that they will listen to our message, but we don't want them focusing on our works because our works aren't perfect. They're not right. But it says that they may see your good works. But what does it say? And glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Now, how is that going to happen? How will people, you know, because here's the thing. When we see good works, normally we just see the person. What is it that makes our good works glorify their Father? Okay. Well, if people, like I said, if people look too much at our works, they're going to get distracted because they're going to find faults. But if they're focusing on our message, they're going to understand we're sinners too. They're going to understand that we're really no better than them. But when they see good works come from us anyway, then they'll understand that, hey, you know what? That's not because of them. That's because of God. That's because of Jesus Christ that's in their life. And unfortunately, we make the mistake of making it so much about us, trying to figure out how we can make ourselves look good, that all they see is us. But when, we're, but when we have the message, when we have the verbal message, what should happen is they will see that we are sinners too. That we have come short of the glory of God. And that anything good they see in us, it's not because of us, it's because of Jesus Christ. But how are they going to get that message if we're not giving them a verbal gospel? They're going to miss that. It's going to go over their head, and it's they're just going to, they'll see our good works, but they're going to see our bad works too, and they're going to find fault. But if they're hearing our message, you know, if they see a bad work too, well, the guy never did claim to be perfect, did he? The guy never did say that the way to go to heaven is by being good, did he? That, he said the reason he's going to heaven is not because he's good, not because he's wearing a pink shirt and cleaning up the streets and being all smiley. He's going to heaven. Because he's put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ and he's paid for his sins. And yeah, he's doing some good stuff, but that's because of Jesus. Amen. They're not going to get that 
unless we've got a verbal message going with it. The reason we have to do the good works and avoid the bad works is so we don't become a distraction. And listen, our message here, that I'm pre- the messages I preach, they come from the Bible, they're the Word of God, they're doctrinally sound, but if I go out and I do something immoral, everybody's going to use that, they're going to use me to distract from the message. Oh yeah, that's that, pre- that, that King James Bible preacher. Yeah, the one that did that, you know, the one that went and robbed the bank, the one that cheated on his wife. Yeah, that's how those King James Bible... What does that have to do with being King James Bible? Absolutely nothing. But what happened? I distracted from the real message because I did not renounce those things. And so I got, I got to watch myself. I got to have a good testimony because I don't, I don't want to distract from what people really need to see. Remember what I said when we read verse 6. Okay, we are not a walking rule book. We're walking in the Spirit. And people, people will know if we are doing things out of love for God versus obligation. They can tell you, know, you, you can't hide it. You know, we, we, all, we all know. We, we can see right through that. You know, and lost people are the carnal man. They don't want to do the things of God. And you know, we can trendy things up around here. You know, we can try to give you know, Christianity a facelift or make it look hip. But that actually defeats the purpose because the truth is what really sends a strong message is when they see people doing things that they shouldn't want to do. But they want to. And we can't stop. You know, They shouldn't want to go to church and sit in a church service and listen to preaching. They shouldn't want to you know, sing those old hymns and put money in an offering plate. Why would they want to do that? That's weird. But you know what? They want to do it. And nobody can stop them from doing it. I mean, the Cubs are in the playoffs and they're still going to church. What is that all about? Can't even stop them from going to church. What is that all about? And now all of a sudden they want to do it. But you know what churches are trying to do today? They're trying to make it more community friendly. Oh, I mean, why would they want to go to a place? You know, you know, we got we got to dress down. We don't want to make people feel uncomfortable. You know, we got we got to make the music more modern and up to date because you know, people aren't comfortable with those old hymns. You know, let's jazz things up a little bit, make them feel better. That's not going to work. You're going to use carnal things to try to give a spiritual message. That defeats the purpose. But when they see people doing stuff that should be boring and loving every minute of it, that is going to get their attention. There must be something to that. There must be something real there. And that is what will actually accomplish something. That's what will actually cause us to shine a light on people. And Nelson, they're going to have, they might have that veil. But listen, if their hearts will turn to the Lord, the veil will be taken away. And all of a sudden, they're going to be like, you know what? I get it now. Yeah, you know what? Amazing Grace, that song's not boring. That song's got a great message. That that song means something to me. Oh, how I love Jesus means something to me now. Hey, all of a sudden, I can understand the Bible. And you know what? It's not boring. I like reading it too. And... What what changed? That veil I take away from their heart. Why they saw the light? They saw they saw the light. They believed on Christ, and we are the ones who got we shine that light. And so the third last thing we need to do real quick, we need to put on display the power of God. It says in chapter four, verse seven. Uh, that's my spot. Chapter. Oh, what I do? Man? Let me turn over there real quick. I can't remember what it is. I'm, too many pages of notes here and I'm, I'm losing them. But this, this, is, this is very important. We have to put on display the power of God. We're the ones that have to show it. Jesus isn't going to show up and do any miracles. We've got to put these things. It says in verse 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. This treasure that we hold, this truth that we have, it's something that's in us that's in this earthen vessel, that there's not much special about us. There's not, there's not much great about this, about this body. And so look what it says in verse 8. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted and forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made, man, made manifest in our body. What's going on here? 
everything that's happening in our life that should be causing problems, it's not. You know, we have this treasure, we have this truth in an earthen vessel. There's some, there some things that get people down. You know, pain, suffering, you know, those things that, you know, that defeat people all the time. We go through those same things, but they don't, they don't affect us like that. They don't, you know, we get persecuted, but we're not forsaken. You know, we're cast down. We have good people, but we're never destroyed. We get back up. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, and it says, And he said unto me, My grace is, is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, and in reproaches, and necessities, and persecution, and distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. What it's saying here is our, we, do, we have this treasure in an earthen vessel. And this vessel, there's not much to it. But because of that, whenever we do accomplish something, you know what it does? It shows the power of God. Because everyone knows we can't do that. There's nothing special about them. But look at what they're able to go through and still have the joy of the Lord. How is that? How can that be? That should destroy them. That should be, defeat them. They've been cast down, but they're not destroyed. Why is that? Because we've got God inside of us. And you know who? And we end up glorifying Him when we do that. And that's why Paul said, My strength is made perfect in weakness. I actually can accomplish more for God and have a better testimony when I'm suffering. Because people quit looking at me and they start looking into my God. And that's what he wanted. He didn't want them looking too close at him. Verse 11 For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. When loss, the lost see mortal man, mortal sinful men, doing things for God by faith, it send a, sends a message that what we have is real. And so sometimes God needs us to suffer. Because our blessings can be a distraction to the lost. People think we're serving God for the wealth or fame. But they can't say that when we don't have anything. You know, I was thinking about, I, I say, I've said this before, but I, one thing I miss about being a teenager is I was a lot more effective. I, always, I felt like my, my testimony was more effective and my soul winning was more effective. Because people are always impressed seeing a teenager, a teenage boy out Knocking doors and giving the gospel. It got their attention. You know, when I worked places and people saw how I was different as a teenager, it got their, got, you know, it got their attention. But now, if people notice I'm different, they find out I'm a pastor. Oh, well, that's why. And then it's like it doesn't have any impact anymore. Yeah, well, we expect pastors to act different, blah, blah, blah. And so it is. It's like it's, it's harder for me to have that good testimony because it's like, yeah, you're getting paid. You know, you're, you know, you're, you know, they, they, you know, they, they think all these things. And so it is, it's, it's harder. You know, if I'm out knocking doors and they find out I'm the pastor, not as impressive as if someone else does it, or especially a teenager does it. You know, why is it? Cause a teenager shouldn't want to be given the gospel. He should want to be partying. You know, he should be wanting to be running around and causing trouble and breaking the law and running from the cops. You know, that's what they, that's what they expect. And, but the fact is, when the world sees weak, sinful man doing things right, doing things for God, it gives God the glory, not us. People get impressed with God, not, not us. And that's what we want. And so verse 13, we having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore we speak knowing that He which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, we're tired, we want to faint, we feel like dying, yet the inward man though is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory, while we look not for the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. When we shine the light, we're going to be walking in the Spirit. And those who are walking in the Spirit, they're not interested in earthly things. They're not interested in the earthly rewards. We're going to be focused on things that are eternal. And while I admit, I do have a desire to gain eternal rewards, I can say without a shot of a doubt, the thing I'm most interested in 
is eternal souls. That, that's, that's eternal. That lasts forever. I can go make a little more money, but I can, I can spend money so much faster than I can make it. It's not even funny. I, I mean, it, it's so easy. And I, I, can't, I, I've, I've, I am so good at spending that I can't. I, I can't even keep up with money I make. Anybody else have that same gift? All right, I, think we all got, I think we all have that gift. But listen, that money disappears just like that, but souls, they're eternal. They don't go away. And so we shine the light for the greatest thing in the world. And that's seeing soul saved. And we've got to do that. Let that light shine. Let your light shine. They may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Not, not glorify us. Let's not get the attention on us. Let's deflect the attention to Jesus Christ. And we do that by letting our light shine. So with that, let's all stand together.